very excited to introduce uh, Annalise Orlick. Um, Annalise is a professor of history at Dartmouth College and has authored five books on the history of U.S. women, politics, and activism, including Storming Caesar's Palace, How Black Mothers Fought Their Own War on Poverty. In her new book that we're here to discuss, We Are All Fast Food Workers Now, The Global Uprising Against Pover Poverty, Annalise chronicles how from berry pickers to garment workers to home health care aides, and from Manila to Cape Town, California to Morocco, low-wage workers are bearing the true cost of globalization, and they are fighting back. In this deeply researched profile of the new global labor movement, Annalise draws on interviews with 140 workers from around the world. Uh, through these compelling and immediate stories, many relate in the worker activist's own words, Orlick vividly conveys what's at stake for these, de uh, these dedicated and resilient people as they struggle for a living wage, safe working conditions, and respect. This book is already garnering praise with author Vicky L. Ruiz cra uh, writing, Crafted with Corazon. This book is a crisply paced panoramic labor history of the here and now. So without further ado, please help me in welcoming Annalise Orlick to Politics and Prose. Thank you so much. Hi, thanks. thanks for coming out. I know it's a holiday uh, weekend, so I appreciate you taking the time. One question that I would like to ask um, you to think about and maybe answer in the in the Q&A is why come out for this discussion? Because uh, part of what's been exciting to me in beginning to have conversations with various people about this book is that this issue of poverty wages is something that's on everybody's mind right now. And the reason it's on everybody's mind is because the changes that this book chronicles and that low-wage workers are fighting against are global. And, um, and they're kind of universal, and that's so in this country as well as abroad. So um, a little bit of, of history of how I, I got to this book, and then um, maybe read a couple of passages, and then hopefully we can open it up uh, for discussion. Um, I, I was one of the organizers in 2011 of the 100th anniversary of the Triangle Factory fire in New York City, um, a terrible tragedy in the garment industry. 146 young workers died uh, in front of thousands of onlookers in the middle of New York. And for almost a century afterwards, it was commemorated every year with this triumphal narrative, right? That was the line in the sand, right? We, as a, as a culture, as a government, we agreed that people shouldn't have to die to earn a living, shouldn't have to risk death every day when they go to work, and we began to get government regulation and strong acknowledgement of labor unions. Well, as we were organizing this event, um, those of us labor historians who were working on it said, we know very well that uh, we've, come, we've gone backwards, not forwards, right? And that you know, since the emergence of the global economy, we have workers who are laboring under conditions that are, again, deadly. And one of the people who made us most aware of this, who's made the whole world aware of it, is Kalpona Akhtar, who's a, uh, one of the leaders of the Bangladesh garment worker struggle. Now, um, in the years leading up to the Triangle Fire, they'd been hundreds of thousands of women in the streets in, in Dhaka and in, in places where clothes, our clothes are being made. And if you think it's not our clothes, start looking at your labels. Uh, and they were, I mean, it was an amazingly vibrant movement. They were shutting down highways. They were shutting down factories, blocking you know, the middle of cities, and yet it got almost no coverage in the United States. And so actor and a number of other union activists thought, let's maybe use all this publicity around the Triangle Fire to get the world to understand what's going on right now. So she walked up on the stage of the Great Hall of the People, Cooper Union, New York City, where 100 years earlier, the biggest strike of women workers to that time had begun. And like Clara Lemlick, 100 years earlier, and whose 95-year-old daughter in 2011 was sitting in the front row, she said, I have something to say, kind of breaking through all the cant and the speeches. And what she said was, in Bangladesh, it's not 2011, it's 1911. And that became one of the themes of this book. I became interested in trying to see how we could have not just made progress, but gone back 100 years. Well, one of the things I found in researching this book is that it's not just 1911 in Bangladesh. It's 1911 uh, in European workplaces, in American workplaces, and certainly in Asian um, and African and Latin American workplaces. And so um, this is a little bit of the story of what I found. It, it is always my way in the things that I write and the books that I write to try to tell things through workers' eyes um, and through activists' eyes to the extent that I can. This is actor. By the way, um, I collaborated in this book uh, with a really wonderful photographer, Elizabeth Cook. And I think if you look, if you look through the book, uh, the images of the of the workers who you will meet in this book are really important in, in you know making it even more of an intimate encounter 
um, than I can make through the words. Okay, second moment of kind of how the book got generated. Tampa, Florida, uh, giving a talk, and I meet the Fight for 15 activists in Tampa. And the Fight for 15 activists there who come to Teresita's Cuban Cafe in, in West Tampa to meet are an interesting amalgam. It's an interesting coalition. It's, um, it's fast food workers. It's home health care workers, although they actually were working so many hours that they Skyped in to this because, as one of the men, Buckner, told me, for us, Fight for 15 is not $15 an hour, although we definitely need that. It's a 15-minute break in our days, right, because we're taking care of such um, fragile people and because they care about the people they take care of. But they nevertheless are human beings and about to collapse if they don't get some, some respite. So, And then there were college professors, adjuncts representing the 75% of teaching PhDs in this country who are on contracts from course to course. And I said to them, this is an interesting working class coalition for an old labor historian. It's not like anything I've seen before. Um, and one of the graduate students and several of the professors began to calculate how much they actually earned uh, with their paper course um, and all of the work they did outside the classroom for which they were not paid advising, writing letters of recommendation, writing lectures. And they figured, one of them said, you know, I figured I made about 8, 8.05 an hour. And Blue Rainier, one of the fast food organizers who was helping to lead them, who's a McDonald's worker in Tampa, said, yeah, we're all, we're all fast food workers now. And what he said was, you know, the thing that fast food workers were always told is, hey, you want to make more money? Go back to school. And he said, and then I found out that my, my adjunct, my professors at the community college where I was trying to go back to school were earning about the same amount that I was. And so he said, the American dream is broken. And that's when Keegan Shepard um, uttered the line that became the title of the book. He said, uh, they try to tell us that with our advanced degrees, everything's going to get better. And if we're just quiet and good, we'll get good jobs and careers. And he said, but that's a lie to keep us quiet because the truth is we're all fast food workers now. So what did that mean that we're all fast food workers now? Um, what it meant is that nobody's an employee anymore, and this is, one of, this is the third theme that I talk about in the book. Everybody's a contract worker. And what's happened, and this is Joanna, Sister Nice Carnation, who's an organizer in the Philippines, and one of the big things they're organizing against, we call it here the gig economy, there they call it contractualization. And, and they are very clear, because as an American colony, the Philippines had labor laws pretty similar to those we had in this country. They're very clear that what contractualization is is an end run around the law, right? It's an end run. You're not really a worker. You're not an employee. You're a contractor. And so therefore, you don't get overtime. You don't get safety protections. And um, you have no job security, no minimum wage. No labor laws apply to you. So that's theme. the next theme is contractualization. The name of this organization. Um, that, that these people have built is another theme, and that theme is respect. The name of the Philippine Fast Food Workers Organization is the RESPECT Fast Food Workers Alliance. Okay, These are a bunch of Brooklyn fast food workers right, who are putting respect um, at the front of what they're organizing for. Um, and these, uh, Venanzi Luna and Denise Barlage, organized the very first strike against the Walmart in the United States in October 2012, and their organization, as you may have heard, is called Our Walmart, Organization United for Respect at Walmart. So that's the, the next um, level on which this movement is taking place, right? The reality that nobody, very few people make a living wage, right? In the United States, it's something like 70% of workers make under $50,000 a year. If you live in Washington, D.C., you know how little that that can buy, right? So that's the majority of the American workforce. Um, but when these guys did a ride for respect to the headquarters in Bentonville, Arkansas, and Walmart, uh, Walmart's headquarters, they weren't even allowed inside. These were their own employees. They were kept on the lawn with police dogs in front of the door to make sure that they couldn't get in. And what they said was really important to them is that one of the organizers, Gershriella Green, told me, even though we're hungry, the first thing people wanted to talk about was being treated decently, not having to go to meetings every morning where we were told how disposable we were, right? not having to be yelled at in front of customers on the floor and told how stupid we were. So 
So that's, that's the next theme is respect. And then the final theme um, that I would address very quickly, and here's, this is Jenny Mills, so that you understand. She is a fully employed worker who is homeless. The car she is leaning against is her house. She has lived in it. Um, she, at that point, when, I took the, when Liz took the picture for more than two and a half years, right? So understand when we talk about jobs and employment now that living wage is only a tiny piece of it. I mean, wages and employment, right, go, go together. And so when you get these jobs numbers that say, hey, the, the economy is healthy, we have very little unemployment, that's, that's not the story. The story isn't whether people have jobs. The story is whether they need to have three of them you know, to keep a roof over their heads and whether they can live in a car when they're unemployed. Okay, so the final piece is feminism. There is a global feminist uprising. The majority of these of workers are women. They're women of color. And, um, and they are galvanized by very explicit women's issues. So um, pregnancy discrimination, sexual harassment and violence, particularly on the workplace floor, wage equity, equal representation in their unions, um, and, um, and the ability to speak out. So one of the key, these are um, Tarek Sok and Vunem of the United Sisterhood Alliance in Cambodia, which organizes garment workers. And they organize garment workers through consciousness raising groups, right? Of the very much like the kind you might see here in the United States um, 40 years ago. And you've got them sitting, you've got folks, uh, and, and it's, it's these women's issues, and it's also the very final issue, privatization, right? That what's happened is that in many of these countries where services like medical care, energy, um, education, water, right, were affordable, um, the results of the new capitalist global economy and, and the lending regimes of the World Trade Organization um, and the World Bank have resulted in people not being able to afford health care. Um, and the way they publicize, the way they, they organize is A, through these consciousness raising groups, and B, um, through this last piece that I'll say, and then I'll read a little bit and we can open up. Um, and that is through what they call cultural work. These are young people. Um, and um, what they have told me again and again, and this, word, this line was uttered by this guy, Lake Hadaman, who choreographed singing, dancing, flash mob protests of low wage workers. Um, he was a musical theater student who decided to use his degree for something bigger than performing on stage. He perform on the ultimate stage, blocking traffic in the 23 million person city of Manila. Um, but what he told me is this is not your grandmother's revolution, right? It's organized through social media. It's organized using popular culture um, and singing and dancing. Um, and uh, it is organized in, um, in ways that um, can be spread uh, in particular through music. So Vunem um, is the lead singer of a band called Messenger Band. Um, and Messenger Band uses the words of garment workers. They take, they record their stories and then they, sit, they play them musically throughout the country. Why is this important? Not just because it's cool and it's not your grandmother's revolution, but because it's a dictatorship um, and, and protesting is banned. Uh, and so you've got these singing, dancing, performers, labor activists in streets of Manila, in the streets of Cambodia, in the streets of the United States, where we're still allowed to protest, although who knows. Um, and, um, and, and what Vunem said um, when the police stopped her is, it's just a concert, right? Nothing to be, nothing to be worried about, right? We're just, we're just a band. Um, so I, I wanted to introduce you to some of the characters um, and then just give you a very quick sense of um, you know, some of, the, some of the wording in the book, and, and then um, open it up to uh, some, some questions. So um, maybe a good place to start is um, talking about, give you, a, give you a sense of the flash mobs. It's a steamy dawn in downtown Manila, already hot though it's only 6.30. A group of slim young men and women in their teens and 20s file out into the middle of a busy avenue wearing white shirts, black pants, and purple headbands. The strains of Katy Perry's firework rise from a boombox heavy on the bass. At other times, they dance to Aretha Franklin's respect. And this is interesting. In the Philippines, one of the, the score, the, the themes, soundtracks for their new labor uprising is heavily 1970s American R&B, um, as well as more contemporary music. Um, 
And they dance to the Disney theme, Let It Go, but this is a morning for fireworks. The kids start to dance with Verve, as perfectly synchronized as a Broadway chorus line. They sing as they move, improvising as they go, riffing on Katy Perrick's lyrics in a mix of Tagalog and English. Ignite the light inside them, let it shine, showing the world what they are worth. They shout, strike poses, pump fists, because baby, we are fireworks. Cars roar in from all directions, drivers honk or tap their fingers through open windows. Motorcycles grind to a halt. Some yell at the dancers to move, others sing along, then comes to chant, what do we want, decent jobs, again and again, to the beat of the song. And this is a really important um, bit, is that they recognize that the, the reputation of labor unions and the reputation of protesters is bad enough that if they don't do something entertaining, people are going to turn off very quickly. Uh, it takes forever to get anywhere in Metro Manila, one of the world's most densely populated cities. It is also vast. City center is choked by sprawling, smoky slums that are home to many young activists in the RESPECT Fast Food Workers Alliance. The poorest among them come from what Joanna Bernice Carnation calls danger zones, where tin and cardboard shacks sit below sea level, flooding every time the inevitable rains and typhoons hit. It's a world of mud and sewage, but also of song and dance. Many of the best performers come from Bagang Silangan, a barangay known for high unemployment and excellent dancers, says Lake Adaman a 23-year-old choreographer, theater student, and labor organizer. So when he and some of these other young organizers realized that in a workforce of people, half of whom, more than half of whom is under 30, um, students were entering dance contests to make a little extra cash for their parents to keep them from getting thrown out, um, they decided to organize them, and they did, into the Dancers Union of Bagang Silangan, dubs, an allusion to a globally popular genre of electronic dance music that grew out of reggae, hip-hop, and techno. And so they began to educate these workers before they would go out and protest. Um, one 19-year-old said, dancing for a cause feels great. Before, I only danced to brag. Now with dubs, I dance for a purpose. Decent and secure jobs, upholding women's rights. These issues have impact on my and my family's lives. So um, this is a little bit of the feeling of what's happened. And so the music has been part of many social movements, young Filipino workers have turned musical theater into protest art. So much so that Manilans are used to encountering street scenes that appear to have been ripped from the sets of television musicals. On May 14th, 2014, a day of global action by fast food workers, and they struck in 40 countries, in hundreds of cities, on six continents, a kind of organizing feat that's only made possible by social media. And they share the pictures, you know, as. Uh, Kalpona actor, the Bangladeshi garment leader, said to me, um, we not, our workers may not have water, but everybody's got a smartphone, right? And so that, that's really important. And, and so they post, they post um, videos of their own protests. They download videos of other protests around the world. They communicate with each other. It's really key. Anyway, on, Mar on May 14th, 2014, um, teenage fast food workers line danced their way through Manila, singing to the music from Disney's animated hit, Frozen. Singing loudly, they urged fellow workers, let it go, don't hold back anymore, let it go, turn away, slam the door. They made up lyrics as they danced, and holding hands in this snake line, they pulled workers from behind counters and into the streets, into the strike. Sa they sang about rising as a new dawn broke, they celebrated the end of fear. All, these are all from the lyrics. Here I stand in the light of day, they sang. If that brought a raging storm, that was fine. McDonald's never bothered me anyway. Um, so again, flash mobs have become a signature of the Philippine labor movement. On International Women's Day 2015, 5,000 trade unionists danced in front of Manila's Malacanang Presidential Palace. Two of all things, Helen Reddy's 1972 hit, I Am Woman. One year later, men danced wearing women's shoes because walk a day in my shoes is a slogan of the low-wage worker struggle everywhere. Um, so that's a little bit of a taste. Now, one thing that I think is really important, though, is that when I've talked, uh, I've talked about certain stories in this book to, um, in, in giving talks and, and in interviews, and one story that strikes a lot of people is the story of, of a hotel housekeeper who um, was not allowed to take time off even as her pregnancy uh, you know, continued and developed. And she was working into her ninth month. And she asked her supervisor for some time off. Like most, like the vast majority of low-wage workers in this country, she didn't have a single paid day off um, in the year. And so, and she was afraid of asking for an unpaid day off that she'd be fired. So she asked her supervisor to let her go. Um, and the supervisor said no. 
Um, and so her water broke while she was making a bed. And she said, I don't care. And she left. And she said, I gave birth. I went to the hospital to give birth in my work clothes, in my uniform. Um, and I had to wash the toxic cleaners, which is a big issue for hotel housekeepers, off my hands before um, I could give birth. And then she was called and fired because she left her shift early. And so she said, by that point, I had nothing to lose. And she became a hotel union organizer and, and two years later successfully organized her hotel into a union. Now, when people ask me about this story, they remember it when they read the book. Reporters have said, could you repeat that story on um, this hotel worker in the Philippines? And I say that's really interesting because she's not a hotel worker in the Philippines. She's a hotel worker in Providence, Rhode Island. So um, I think it's really crucial for us to understand that what global capitalism did to drive wages um, and working conditions down all over the world has come back to this country um, and has done the same here. Um, so I want to introduce you uh, to another phenomenon and, and then we can, I, I know I'm supposed to be fast, so open up and have some discussions. Blur and ear in this picture, well, I'll read you a little bit of, I'll read you a little bit of that piece and then um, and maybe we can talk. In July 2015, Blue Rainier, a 26-year-old Tampa, Florida McDonald's worker, opened his mail and found an invitation to testify before the Brazilian Senate. I was kind of shocked, he laughs. McDonald's workers in Brazil had filed charges of wage theft, unsafe working conditions, and violations of Brazil's labor laws. This moved the Senate Human Rights Commission to convene an unprecedented hearing. Their goal was to determine if McDonald's, which was the second largest employer in Brazil, but which had operations in more than 100 countries, was driving down wages and eroding safety conditions worldwide. So the Brazilian Senate, this is before the coup, invited fast food workers from the US, Europe, Latin America, and Asia to testify about Brazil's and the world's second largest private employer. On August 16th, 2015, Rainier and colleagues from the Philippines, Korea, Japan, New Zealand, and many other countries came to tell their story. They were greeted by cheering crowds at the Brasilia airport. People from different unions and politicians from all over Brazil and all over the globe were coming to talk about how McDonald's tries to keep us at the bottom, Rainer recalls. It was amazing because McDonald's has employees everywhere. Everything they do has a global impact that affects all workers. Rainer's life had been marked by starvation wages, uncertain scheduling, and boiling oil. In eight years, I made no more than $8.05 an hour. I witnessed the torture of not having enough to afford rent, which led me to me sleeping from house to house. I even had to sleep at bus stops because I was homeless. There have been nights that I had to go without food so I could buy a bus pass so that I could get to work the next day. I have had to rely on food stamps to get a good meal, and when those food stamps run out, it's back to square one, which is nothing at all. Sometimes I think I'm working so hard every day. Why am I not making a living wage? Why can't I feed myself? Why am I still hungry? Though Rainier had already joined the fight for a living wage, he experienced moments in Brazil that he said changed him. Quote, I met this really cool guy from Japan, another McDonald's worker. He showed me his arm full of burns. So Rainier raised his arm and held it alongside. The men were burned in exactly the same places. Rainier knew how his colleague had been scarred. They make you get orders out in 90 seconds, he explained. You're constantly behind, so you're not thinking about safety. You're worried that your manager is going to push you. He said a chill passed through him when he saw the matching burns. The men had more in common than their injuries. Me and him have exact same, exactly the same story, Rainier learned. I didn't know it would be that way. Both men had tried to enroll in college but had to drop out. He wasn't earning enough to pay tuition and neither was I. It was my whole story except he was in Japan. Rainer felt the pieces fall into place. When Benedict Murillo from Manila, another fast food worker who'd come, heard the men's stories, he rolled up his sleeve and held out his arms. He had the same burns. He also had left college because he couldn't pay tuition. Their skin colors, languages, backgrounds were different, Murillo says. Still, the three were what Murillo called Mick brothers, members of the new global working class. Later, when Murillo told the story, when he went back to a union hall in Quezon City, all the fast food workers there placed their arms on the table, fist to fist like spokes in a wheel, rolled up their sleeves, identical lines of burns scored each arm. So one of the questions that people have asked is, how do you get a global labor movement? Um, and how do people in these conditions who are working you know, 50, 60 hours a week or more, um, who are cut off 
um, from an education? How do they get an understanding of global capitalism? Uh, because they work for the same corporations very often um, and because they experience the same kinds of, um, of, of terrible effects. Now, so all of this has galvanized this movement that I just you know, want to say before I open up to questions, has had a surprising amount of success. Between 2012 and 2016, low-wage workers in the United States won for themselves $61.5 billion in raises. That is 12 times what Congress gave them the last time they raised the federal minimum wage in 2007. Wages have doubled in, um, in uh, from Mexico berry pickers. You've had a strike of 50,000 uh, people growing berries in Baja, California in 2015 and strikes all the way up the West Coast to uh, Sakuma Berry with the biggest blueberry producers in Washington State. They want a union in both places. They doubled their wages. Um, at the same time, they've also had a great deal of success in, um, in making themselves more visible. And that is really one of the keys, I think, to understanding um, this movement. Here you have Jim Sitar and Pau Trimoni, who organized a union of 4,000 hotel workers in, um, in Phnom Penh, all of whom are hotel housekeepers, the most invisible of all workers, right? And one of the, the organizers who I interviewed, Massimo Frattini, said, you know, we, get, we leave our hotel room in the morning, and then we come back. It's so nice. It's like a fairy came. You know, the room is perfect. And so he said, for us, step one is trying to help people see that these are human beings doing this job and to make the invisible visible. So here again, I come back to the United States in one place where workers were, were very much not visible, Cambridge, Harvard Square, the double tree, which Harvard refused to negotiate with when the housekeepers wanted a union to reduce the number of, um, of rooms they had to do each day. And they opened up, they brought a bed out into Harvard Square. And they had everybody, they taught everybody and had them physically do it. Anyone who was willing had to make a bed the way hotel housekeepers have to. Right? And, people, and people physically experience the, the, you know, the ways you have to stretch your body and you know, the physical labor of, of lifting up these new, heavy, luxurious mattresses and all of, that, all of that work. And then they said, so now imagine you're asked to do it 20, 24 rooms a day, right? which, is, which, is, which was what we are asked to do. So these are some of the kinds of strategies that you're seeing. In Asia, McDonald's workers do these mock trials of Ronald McDonald in the street. They bring an actor dressed as Ronald McDonald, and you walk by on the street, and his face is down, and he's crying, and you've got the workers you know, having this mock trial in the street. Visibility, making the invisible visible, um, is really, really crucial uh, to this movement. So um, in terms of positive change, there's been wages. Another really important development, which you know, we can talk about in the Q&A, is targeting the top of the supply chain and making agreements. So this was pioneered by uh, the Coalition of Immokalee Workers in Florida, the tomato pickers, in a region that had been described as ground zero for modern slavery. Um, and indeed, when they organized, they found and helped to free 1,200 literally enslaved workers. This is not in you know, the 19th century. This is between 2011 and 2014. Um, and what they decided to do is you'd not target just your, your immediate bosses because they don't have a lot of leeway, but go to the top of the supply chain, the people who buy the tomatoes, the fast food companies, Walmart, um, the big grocers. And so they traveled around the country making themselves visible and having protests in front of these uh, businesses. And it was a remarkable success. You got um, big corporations to sign. And what they agreed to do was pay a penny a pound more to farms that raised the workers' wages, that allowed inspectors, safety inspectors, to come in and wage inspectors to come in um, who were chosen by the workers, not by the company, um, and to be legally bound to make repairs, also zero tolerance for sexual violence, um, and then be legally bound to make repairs if, um, if those were found in the inspection. That has spread, and one of the most important versions of it, one of the global versions, is the Bangladesh Fire and Safety Accord. After the 2013 Rana Plaza factory collapse in Bangladesh, which killed 10 times the number of workers who died at Triangle, um, 1,200 died, um, 2,500 were wounded. Uh, these uh, activists started traveling the world and talking to consumers, and ultimately consumers and these, these labor consumer coalitions put enough pressure on the biggest clothing makers in the world, um, excluding Gap, Walmart, and the US military, which refused to sign. But the 225 largest 
clothing companies in the world, apart from those, signed an agreement that said we will, um, we will pay for inspectors to come into these buildings. Because one of the pieces, one of the things I talk about in this book is the rise of fast fashion. And fast fashion has grown so much that Americans buy five times the clothes they did in 1980. Right, and so that meant you want to be producing it everywhere, and and so it's being produced in factory buildings that are not safe. Um, so the safety accord um, got these factories inspected. Seventy-five percent of what they found has been remediated, and the companies signed on to make it legally binding. So they were legally bound, and they they opened themselves up to be sued in their own countries um, if they didn't make those repairs. Remarkably, you had 200 workers a year dying in Bangladesh making our clothes and average, uh, in 2017, none did. So these kinds, of, this, this, this tactic is spreading to the global electronics industry. We uh, won a big victory in Vermont recently, um, where Ben and Jerry's agreed to do uh, the same after years of pressure. So there's a lot of really interesting things going on um, in terms of victories. So this book is both a story of working conditions and, and, and the cost of globalization through the eyes of the workers, but it's also a story of their remarkable victories, and it, it is very much a history of now because the, the struggles, the victories, um, are all just in the last, really, five, five to ten years. So um, let's open it up, and I, I, hope, I hope you'll be interested and, and uh, want to learn more, and thank you for coming out. One of the things that we have also noticed uh, in contemporary uh, environments is the rise of the right-wing politician. Yeah. And that obviously has impacts on low-paid workers, as we know here in the United States, where all of our regulatory agencies, including OSHA and the Wage and Hour Division, have been hollowed out so that there is no enforcement. So could you talk about uh, any movement in response to the rise of these reactionary political movements? Yeah. Um, one of the things that, that's happened in the United States is a lot of focus, and in, and in other parts of the world too, a lot of focus on city governments, um, which have proven very, very friendly overall to increasing wages. Now, that's not a... That's not a given, right, because the Koch brothers and ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, have passed through a lot of legislatures these bills, that state legislatures, these bills that say that cities can't raise minimum wage or, or enact their own safety conditions uh, differently from, from what's done at the state level. Um, but, that, but that battle is engaged, and cities have been really important, uh, important places. The other thing they've done, really interesting, one woman I talked to, Tiffany Faulkner, who organizes for our Walmart, um, found that that movement interestingly split. Some of those low-wage workers voted for Trump. They believed that he was going to be, you know, making their lives better, bring back manufacturing so they didn't have to work in Walmart anymore. Um, and what she's done is she said, no, you know, we're not going around judging. What we're going around doing is saying, if you voted for this man because he said he was going to make things better for workers, then get out there and hold his feet to the fire. Get out there and say, this is why I voted for you. This is what you did. Um, you know, and then in, in other countries, the, the, there's a similar thing in the sense that this is not necessarily a right or left kind of vision. And so um, there's, an, there, there's, there's an attempt to reach out across lines of, of political difference and say you've got low-wage workers who sh have many different kinds of, of ideologies and we just urge you to get out there um, and, and, and work together. And, it's very brave. I mean, in Duterte's Philippines, in Hun Sen's Cambodia, um, even in Sheikh Hasina's Bangladesh, uh, South Africa's just changed hands, but great workers organizing in Zuma's South Africa. These were dangerous, very, very dangerous things to do. Uh, I don't want to change the discussion from yeah. all the wonderful particulars you brought up, but I'm particularly interested in the term precariat. Yes. And I just wondered about your comfort level in using this new term, which seems to me to work for a lot of situations. Yeah. I, um, in in a, a section of the book called Realizing Precarity, I talk about how I define that. Um, and, you know, I certainly didn't make it up. Uh, it's been floating around and gotten lots of definitions from, from many different people over the last 20-ish years. And um, the way... I, I really took a lot from Blue Rainier himself. He said precariat, you know, he calls it a McJob. Right? It's another word for a McJob. And a McJob is not a job only for McDonald's, although in a, a staggering one in eight Americans has worked at a McDonald's at one point or another in their lives. Um, but, uh, but, but the precariat are the people who 
are not employees anymore, right? They work on contracts. They're not covered by labor laws. They don't have job security. They don't have a chance of real job mobility. And, um, and they are the ones who make, it's not just fast food places run, they make universities run, right? They make, they make hospitals run, they make airports run. Airports are really interesting because the airport workers have flooded into unions and they have really kind of gone back. They're not just organizing as workers, they've come to the conclusion Fall 2016, the 20 largest airports in the United States, you had all these people flooding back into unions. They're arguing that we need, if you're going to make us contract workers, then we want contracts that we can negotiate, right, and that, and that we negotiate together. So that's my view of precariat, and I think it's, it is, I do agree that it's replaced the proletariat. And one of the organizing strategies that um, some of these groups are doing are trying to bring the proletariat back. And so um, in terms of city governments, one of the most exciting projects was launched by Los Angeles Alliance for a New Economy. They're making agreements with city governments because the cities buy a ton of stuff, right? Particularly transit trucks, uh, buses. And they're making agreements that when companies bid to build these, to, to build these trucks and buses and, and trains, um, that they agree to make at least a sizable percentage of them in the city to hire workers from that city. Um, to make them environmentally friendly, gender equitable, and union jobs. And we've seen it, they've, they've had success in New York, LA, and Chicago. Um, I would think Washington might be a place where, you know, where that comes. Okay, yes. Hi, so um, thank you so much, this is great. Um, I, I've been paying attention lately to the issue of prison labor. I was just at the African American History and Culture Museum and there's a piece on Angola where there are, I don't, can't even remember, 5,000 prisoners, most of whom are expected to die in jail and um, are being paid pennies on the dollar for um, farming cotton fields. Um, it, do you address that at all and just any thoughts you have? I mean, I think in, in many ways prison labor is part of, of this system um, and, you know, there's degrees of unfree labor. Um, but I don't, one thing I talk about is uh, that Calpona Actor uh, was successful in getting Barack Obama and the Senate to pass an Obama to sign a bill banning importation into the United States of goods made with slave, la slave labor. And, um, and it, it got, you know, there were U.S. officials in inspection stations around the world, uh, you know, how you know, how much force it will have, you know, in the age of Trump uh, is anybody's guess, but because it was not an executive order, it was a, con you know, it was a bill, um, it's, it has not yet um, been repealed. But one of the things that I point out is that the biggest glaring absence um, is, is prison labor. Um, but I do believe prison labor is a part of this, of this system. Hi. Hi. Um you had talked about that accord, I think it was by garment companies, yes, um, which was a big victory. Could you talk a little bit about um, how long it was and what was the pressure on the companies, you know, and the movement, all the protests that took place probably in a lot of different countries. There was probably certain kind of unity between workers in different countries. I'm wondering what the timing was, you know, how long did it take? What was the pressure on the companies? Yes, there'd been, there'd been movement, um, especially by consumers in the garment industry for a number of years. In this country, United Students Against Sweatshops was really mm -hmm. important in getting, uh, pressuring their campuses to make college logo wear in safely uh -huh. um, produced humane mm -hmm. environments. Uh, Workers' Rights Consortium here in, mm -hmm. in Washington, D.C., and headed actually by a former Dartmouth student, Scott Nova, um, was, was really crucial. In Europe, Clean Clothes Campaign um, was really, really important. And, um, and in Asia, the Asia floor wage um, movement all, all worked for years um, on, uh -huh. uh, on these very same issues. But like Triangle, the Rana Plaza collapse, you know, just, it horrified the world. Uh, okay. And it, it made people realize the images, interestingly and horrifyingly, I mean, some of those images look very much like the Triangle images of bodies on the street and families looking, trying to find their loved ones. So I think it took years and it also took uh, the worst tragedy in the history of the garment industry uh, uh. to get people. Um, consumers, particularly in the UK and, um, and Scandinavia, uh, were very, uh. very important. H&M is the second largest clothing producer in the world. Right. Um, and so uh, Scandinavian unions, Scandinavian consumers really put a lot of pressure on H&M. And so early on, they started talking a better line 
than, uh -huh. than other companies. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Here, Becca. Hi, Annalise. Um, so my question is where this fits in your larger body of work as a historian. So you've written on women activists in the early 20th century, welfare mothers in Nevada. What are some of the themes that you see throughout those different parts of history? Um, what's new in this movement? And then secondly, as a historian, what's the process like between working with archival material versus oral histories versus this, which is happening right now, and you're talking to you know 140 people instead of a small group? Um, thank you. Yeah. I mean, it, it's an interesting question. I mean, you know, in terms of the garment industry, uh, I in, in a new edition of my first book, which came out last year, the, the new introduction compares these new garment union leaders to those early 20th century Jewish and Italian, you know, women labor activists that, that I wrote about in my first book. And I think uh, their stories are very similar. Right? There's stories of child labor, there's stories of, of organizing for an education, uh, there's stories of trying to get male-dominated unions to pay attention to them. So, and I think you know, there's stories of uh, workers being treated as if they're not fully human. So I think that there's a lot of, of, of crossover. Um, I'll get to the methodological question in a minute, but another piece is um, something that the sociologist George Katsiafikis calls the Eros effect, which is you know, how infectious protest is and how it changes your mind and it changes your willingness to put up with, um, with being abused. And um, I found that in working on the welfare rights book a lot. And, um, and, I, and I quote in this book Ruby Duncan, who I wrote about in that book, who led the Nevada welfare rights movement, who said, after a lifetime of things being demanded of us, it felt incredible to finally being the one, be the ones doing the demanding. So I mean, I think there's a lot. That, that is a lot of crossover, and, um, and, and that struck me. And indeed, one of the ways I started the book, I was finishing my last book, a kind of a survey of American women's activism, and I, there was this 22-year-old fast food worker from Brooklyn, um, Nkwasia Legrand, who was talking about organizing, and it sounded like right, the teenage garment workers who, you know, in the early 20th century. So a lot of crossover. Um, can you write a history of now? Um, can you, what happens when you talk to people who are still alive? Increasingly, that's what I've gravitated to doing. I mean, there's plenty of documents that I, that I looked at for this book. It's not like I didn't. But um, as I said, it's not a conventional work um, of scholarship. But I did feel as I was writing it that even though I'm a historian, and even though I'm writing about, or as a historian writing about now, it still felt like I was writing a history, right? Because this is such a historic moment in you know, relations of production and, and, you know, economy and labor and women's rights. So um, honestly, except for the fact that Beacon made me write it incredibly fast, um, as opposed to the other books, it, it didn't feel all that different. <laughs> other questions? Oh, hi. Thank you for your interesting talk. You. Could you talk a little bit about uh, what, if any, what are the impacts of artificial intelligence and robots on wages uh, now, and what do you think it'll be in the future? Yeah. Will any of I mean, us have jobs? <laughs> what? Will any of us have jobs? I mean, that's obviously, that's obviously an important question. Um, and Trump's first nominee for the Secretary of Labor, Andy Puzder, um, famously was quoted as saying that he'd much rather spend the money to, to put in machines than to give his workers a raise, because he said, you know, robots they don't call in sick, they don't talk back, um, and they don't launch sexual harassment suits. Those were the three issues that he felt you could really avoid by having, by having robots. Um, my feeling is that uh, I think as we're finding um, with the uh, robotic cars and the recent disasters, um, and uh, with many attempts to robotize, for example, hotels in Scandinavia, there have been a lot of attempts to, to put in robots. Uh, in the end, you still need people. You still need people behind them. You still need people you can contact when they when when they fall through. Um, you still need people to fix them. So um, <coughs> I think probably um, for 50, 70 years, we've been saying we're going to be put out of work by robots. Um, I, I think it's a threat that they hold over workers' heads more than um, than a likely eventuality that they won't have jobs. Clara, yeah. Um, so. Did you, by any chance, touch on the subject of intimate garment wear? Because um, in Brazil, for example, when I lived there, the Dimelos company used to 
force women to strip down to their underwear at the end of their shift yeah. to make sure that they were not stealing the expensive uh, underwear that was going to be exported to Europe and the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, that sort of thing. That sort of thing was really common. Not even not just in places where they're making underwear, but um, any place where they're making clothes because they searched women um, in very invasive, um, assaulting kind of ways to make sure that they weren't stealing clothes. Um, they weren't stealing any kind of products as they left the store. So that's one of the reasons why zero tolerance for sexual violence in the workplace, gender-based violence in the workplace, is maybe the single most important issue to the women workers um, that, that I spoke to. Okay. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you, that was fantastic. Um, I had a question. Uh, you mentioned that city governments were a lot easier, to, they had a lot more progress in, in lobbying them. Um, what was it from the, the cases you um, looked into about sort of the politics or the way that cities were governed that made that sort of a, made that more successful as an approach? Um, I think it's a couple of things. I mean, it's a more, it's still a more face-to-face -face government situation than we have, um, obviously, with this, you know, with this vast federal bureaucracy, um, and that um, made it. I mean, obviously, cities, you know, a hundred years ago were famous for being cash registers, and they still are. But in an odd sort of way, um, it also was a was a hedge against corruption, and um, and I think. Um, as I said, the, the, the mass transit, the city investment in infrastructure um, made it really, really uh, potent for things like um, community benefits agreements. I mean, that's been one of the most positive things in this, to come out of this movement, is harnessing um, the profits made in urban gentrification in ways that gave back to the community. So a lot of these community benefits agreements that these um, activists have organized um, have done things like guarantee affordable housing when you have big projects built, um, lower environmental impact, again, um, make sure it's gender equity and hiring and union workers, so all those things. But one thing, that, one victory that, that they won in New York City last summer really struck me. One of the things workers complained about the most is scheduling by algorithm so that you can't know, like they can just call you in, the computer decides when you get called in based on their predictions of the busiest times of day. And so if you, you know, don't have childcare and you gotta go, you know, you, you're faced with having to lose your job. And so um, they were able to win, a, the New York City Council made it law in the city of New York and now they're using that as a precedent to go elsewhere that said you must give your workers two weeks, two week schedules, right, which is, which would be revolutionary in low wage work in this country if it spreads. So that's the other thing. If you can pass it in one city, then you've got a precedent. Like the LA living wage law of the mid 90s, there are now hundreds of them um, in cities across the country. So anyway, I don't know if that helps. <laughs> Hi. Hey there, thanks so much. Thank um, you. you mentioned that uh, women are leading this movement. Yeah. What's up with men? <laughs> The men are in the movement. I mean, they there's are. no question, particularly in the farm workers' struggle. It's just that we have sex segregation of the labor force and a lot of low-wage workers. The majority of low-wage workers in the world are women and women of color. And so um, it's certainly not that men are not involved. Um, but even when they're involved, uh, it's really interesting. They, they're often involved in women's issues. So um, one of the most creative unions that I found in this research is Sikola Sanke, which was a union of grape pickers in the South African wine industry. And um, it means we grow together in Hosa, and um, they made them, they call themselves warriors against um, violence against women. And so even the men who join, everyone who joins that union um, has to say that they will fight domestic violence and sexual assault every, anywhere they find it, whether it's employers, whether it's in their families, whether it's husbands and wives. Um, so there are definitely men involved. Um, the other group that I, I really didn't talk about who's really crucial is um, there are, you know, in terms of fast food workers, um, there's very much of a feel that, that and they've said, they said to me, we are today's civil rights movement, and they quote Fannie Lou Hamer's, I'm tired, sick and tired of being sick and tired, and indigenous workers, in terms of the farm workers, um, and remaking agribusiness, um, this is a movement that's heavily indigenous, 
in many, many parts of the world. So um, it's, it's, it's all of those things. Um, but it is, it is definitely a resurgence of global feminism, and that was exciting. Um, Bernice, Sister Nice, who I showed you a picture of earlier, said to me in all seriousness, as if this was going to be an easy task in you know, her 27 years, she said, I said, what work is before you? She said, well, you can't dismantle capitalism without dismantling patriarchy, so we have work to do. It's like, OK. <laughs> My question's a little off the topic of your book, but you do mention the rise of moon, movement, um, unions, yeah. unions in these other countries. Um, I wanted to ask you, what do you think the future of unions is in here in the United States? <laughs> <laughs> the sixty-four thousand dollars question. Um, you know, I think it's better than we think. I mean, obviously, the Janus decision, if it comes down. Um, negatively will have a devastating effect on public sector unions, which are the backbone of what's left of the labor movement in the United States. Mm -hmm. But um, as, you know, people, you know, the airport workers, you know, give us a sense that, that things are starting to change and that people are joining unions again. Um, and so, and I think um, when I spoke to some of the older union activists in Unite Here and SEIU, who've been very mm -hmm. important driving forces in this struggle, they, a lot of them were, um, survivors uh, who got their cut their teeth in the United Farm Workers um, in the in the 1960s and 70s, and they said um, it was more than a union; it was a movement, right? Okay, and right. that's what we're trying to do: is to rebuild this idea, not of unions as like just negotiating wages mm -hmm. and hours, um, but as community-based movements. <laughs> and um, and it ends up so they organize by community and. Um, I don't know. I remember I'm a hopeless optimist, but um, <laughs> I did come out of it even. Um, in the F, even where we are now, and I, I understand this is a very dark political moment in the U.S. and in many parts of the world, but, um, but I came out of it with a sense of optimism, and maybe it's partly mm -hmm. that so many of them are very young, mm -hmm. um, and right. they said we're young, we, we, we can't afford to be anything but optimistic. So, <laughs> I, you know, plus, yes. <laughs> yeah, I leave you, I leave you with that idea <laughs> okay, that we can't afford to be anything but optimistic. Oh, I'm glad, I'm glad you're positive. You know, <laughs> given <laughs> gotta, what's gotta going try. on. <laughs> I was very interested in the uh, in the statistic you gave about the success when you first sort of changed from uh, from the stories of workers to the store, you know. But there's been there have been successes, and you gave a story on on the amount of uh, money and increased earnings on the part of low wage workers, and compared that to um, I guess legal. Uh, laws passed and so forth. Can, yeah, can you go Congress over that again and kind of explain what you were, well, in whatever time is left here, I don't know. So. Yeah, um, you know, the minimum, I mean, we all know it, right? The wages have been, have been stagnant for 40 years at least, right? And, and that, you know, if they're stagnant, it means that they can buy less, right? So um, they're not just stagnant, in a sense, they're falling. And um, what was revealed is there was, and you probably, I don't even know if any of you knew about it or saw it because there was so little coverage of it, but three weeks after the 2016 election, there was a civil disobedience campaign in 300 cities across the United States called Days of Disruption. And on the eve of the Days of Disruption, in which low-wage workers disrupted everywhere, they sat down in streets all over the country and disrupted fast food businesses and ran into legislatures and had airport slowdowns. And this statistic that I just gave you was released the night before. Um, the days of disruption. The statistic that work, low wage workers had won for themselves through local legislation and state legislation and companies just saying, okay, we'll do it, right? Um, they had won for themselves $61.5 billion in wages in four years. In four years. And when Congress had last raised the minimum wage, the federal wage was, was 2007. Um, and this gave them 12 times the income boost overall. And um, LaFonza Butler, who was the co-chair of the LA Living Wage Campaign, who was one of this new generation of young women of color labor leaders, said the psychological boost of that is also profound, right? Because if people used to losing and used to being abused and, and used to, she said, people who feel strangled by how little they're paid, right? And so that victory, that's why those numbers were released, right? To say, We've won these gains, and their big slogan on the day of Days of Disruption were, we won't go back. Days of Disruption, by the way, were global. There were a million people in the streets in, Korea, in South Korea, um, students walking out. The, um, there were um, strikes all over Brazil. Um, there were strikes around the world you know, to, to, with this idea that we won't go back. We've made, we've made these gains, and, and we have to somehow hold on to them. 
Thanks. Okay. Thank you, guys.